Well, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for sticking around for the last talk, the product talk. Uh, we'll try to, to make it entertaining. Uh, we got three people. Uh, myself, Laurent Garrigue, I'm a product manager. I'll be assisted by uh, Liz and uh, Janelle, also product manager. And they're going to do most of the work. I'm just introducing the concept and then do most of the demo. Uh, the clicker, here we are. And this one. I got a quick agenda. Uh, I'll give you an overview of, uh, of OCS. Uh, we've been presenting about OCS for a couple of years now. Uh, you saw quite a bit this morning at the, during the keynote, but still, for some people who doesn't know what it is. And then we'll go straight into the demo from, from Liz. Uh, and then I'll cover the initial scenario for OCS. Then we move to more demo uh, from Liz and Janelle. And then I'll tell you about the go-to-market and, and pricing about OCS, and then about the roadmap. And maybe we'll have time for questions. If not, we we'll can talk later. So for the overview, uh, you've seen this slide, the positioning of OCS on the left-hand side for uh, large enterprise and, uh, and community uh, scenarios, but as well for new customer or other things. So even though for existing customer, we position OCS on that side, uh, it could be used uh, by its on its own for, for new customers as well. Uh, why uh, OSS so classifies in the first place? Well, essentially, is to make sure that you have all your data available from anywhere outside your corporate network and available for, for yourself, but also available for partners and other people you might be working with. Uh, empower people to take that data into something else using technology that's usually difficult to deploy on-premise, uh, cloud technology, other things, working with partners. So uh, we're pushing the data out where those things exist. Uh, and then really connect with more people, more uh, sometimes the expertise is not in-house. Uh, you need a service provider, uh, technicians or analysts or data scientists outside your uh, company to help you out. So it's just really the goal of OCS for existing customers to uh, make the data they have available outside and take more advantage of that. Uh, we quite quickly, uh, OCS is not the same technology of the Pi system and it's not a Pi system we host in the cloud. That's something we uh, developed uh, newly uh, a couple of years ago to take advantage of the scale out of the cloud technology. And that's something we also maintain and manage on your behalf. So that's really a platform as a service solution. Uh, it is meant to be very complementary or uh, synergistic with the Pi system and the edge data source. So we expect people to really use all three different technologies close to the edge with the ES, uh, on-prem, close to the plant, critical operation. We heard about that earlier in this track. And, and then in the cloud uh, to aggregate and uh, support more scenarios. In terms of componentry, uh, that's a multi-tenant architecture. So we're supporting multiple uh, customers within the same cluster of the machine. We have generic uh, tool set for signing up and provisioning new accounts. We have some for, for telemetry and monitoring out what's happening. Of course, security and authentication. You just missed the security talk on OCS was in the other track, but that's really interesting. And uh, other thing, for obviously, for scaling out. So the more we have customer, we just, as Greg, uh, mentioned this morning, we just go to 11, and uh, that's just as easy as that to get a lot more customer onboarded. In terms of what happened within a customer account, we got also that attendance. Uh, Chris mentioned this morning this concept of a namespace, which is really uh, an environment for data to be kind of isolated and mostly for doing uh, development work or production work or to go from one, one region to another region so you make sure the data stays in country. And within those namespace, we have the data services where you can actually work with the data. So for data ingress from, from Pi and from OMF application, Janelle will go through that, uh, but also for storage, obviously, and, and then expanding the value with data views. Liz will talk about that context. Uh, we saw trending a bit this morning. We'll show you that again uh, today. And then have more namespace if you need to in different region or for different purposes. Uh, in terms of deployment, uh, Greg told us this morning that we're being initially only deploying in, in the West US region, supporting local customer, and we say North, North America, but also so Canada, Mexico, LATAM, they usually all fit into this uh, area. And also global customers that are willing to put the data uh, in, in North America. Now we have also a new deployment in Western Europe, and now we can support local people in Europe, and also global customers that want to have data in country wherever they are, uh, we have a lot of global customer and we'll keep adding more data centers as demand uh, required. So that's it for the overview. I'm gonna call Liz to come and, and give you an example of what we can do with OCS. Please Thank take you. it away. Hi everyone, thank you, Laurent. Uh, so as Laurent said, my name is Liz. 
Elizabeth Macarlane, and I'm a strategic project manager here at OSIsoft. So one of the things that I've been working on um, the past year is enabling um, access to large data sets, adding support for that into OCS. Um, so um, a lot of our customers and partners today use Pi integrators or use our developer technologies to do this with Pi system today. Pi system data and prepare data sets from Pi to make them available to analytics. Um, but we're also working on adding some similar capabilities and support to OSI soft cloud services. Um, so what better way for us to kind of show off um, some of the capabilities that we've been working on and some of the value of OCS than with a real live data science use case. So at OSI soft, we um, we, as you saw this morning in the keynote, use our own software to um, kind of work our own operations and make them more efficient. And you saw a lot of different projects um, and initiatives that Greg and Chris talked about today. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about for this demo is really specifically around analyzing cooling unit performance at the San Leandro Tech Campus building. Uh, so um, we're going to work on just like a small part of that. Really, can we answer the single question up here? Um, can we accurately predict the cooling unit performance at the SLTC building? So to answer that question, I combined our Pi system data from, from that building, um, the San Leandro Tech campus, used Pi to OCS to get that into our OSIsoft OCS account. And then we're going to create a data view. A data view is a kind of like a curated data set that's been ready, uh, that's ready for analytics. Uh, so you might do some organization of that data, join several related streams together, uh, contextualize it, do some filtering, um, all of those things that you really need to do to make it ready to be consumed by an, um, an analytic. So after that, I'm actually going to show off um, Azure AutoML in an Azure notebook powered by Jupyter. I'm not a data scientist, uh, so this is an easy way for me to kind of get a jump start uh, without having to know all the ins and outs of um, uh, data science. And then finally, we're going to generate some predictions and write that back into OCS using the API. And I'll show you the results in the new trending experience that you saw this morning. So it turns out that we can predict um, the cooling, uh, which you're seeing here on the trend. This is the trend experience in OCS. And uh, you're seeing the actual results of the experiment that I'll walk you through. And you can see we've got, in the blue trace, the predicted values, and the orange trace, the actual values. Uh, and we're looking at this just a single day in August. Um, we've generated these predictions at a five-minute sampling frequency. Um, not too bad for the first pass. Obviously, you'd want to do a lot uh, more work to continue training this. Um, but yeah, it looks pretty good. So let's dive into the actual demo. OK, I think this is playing. Uh, so here we're just looking in the OCS customer portal at the data view that I've already created. The data is already in OCS. We're aligning it on the left-hand side by timestamp. Uh, and then we've got several columns with metadata and then the sequential data. So the next thing we're going to do is open up my uh, Azure uh, Notebook project. I'm going to go ahead and open up the Jupyter Notebook. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Jupyter Notebook is um, kind of a really visual interface for building, kind of running code and storing that report as you go along. Uh, so the first cell that I ran here was just importing the modules I, I need for the code for the rest of the notebook. And then we authenticate to OCS securely using a client key. And here's the data view structure. Um, so I just showed you it in the UI. This is what it actually looks like in the JSON representation. And now I'm actually going to query for the data. So you can see we're getting the interpolated data. And then I'm going to transform it into a pandas data frame, uh, which is a really useful object for data scientists to work with. So here we go. Here's our data. We've got it in the notebook. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is split this data set into training and testing data sets. And then I will send that to our Azure um, automated machine learning experiment. I'm not going to run that in real time. That's already been done. Um, and then once I get the best model, according to the AutoML, I use that to generate my next day's worth of predictions. All right, so now here we are back in the OCS portal. This is the trending experience. I'm just searching over here in the top right 
for the streams that I want to add onto the trend. Uh, first, we've got the predictions and then the actual values, and then I'm going to go ahead and just merge those onto the same axes. And there you go. Pretty easy, right? Pretty cool. Uh, so now you've seen an actual use case, highlighted a couple of the new features that we've been working on, and I'm going to hand it back to Laurent. So we didn't want it to hang in without seeing something valuable and interesting. That's why we had this demo first. But I want to go back to the initial scenario we targeted with OCS. And they haven't changed for the last three years we've been talking about it. So the first one is really platform as a service and, and partner apps. So essentially, I'll talk about that later. But essentially, you can use OCS as a gr ground for you to build your own application, calculation, integration with the cloud platform. But also, we have a lot of partners that are connecting to OCS and delivering added value on top of the data. Uh, we just saw data science, so it's kind of circling orange because it's almost released. So it's like in preview now, and you can start playing with that. And the last one, which is uh, um, remote operation monitoring. So we have training capabilities. Uh, we're going to have more visualization in OCS. But now, connecting with EDS and OMF application, now you can reach out to devices and assets you couldn't have visibility to before. And now you can train and look at the data within OCS. So we can start enabling those uh, remote operation monitoring as well. And the last one, community is already working with the partners. Uh, we're going to work more on that to make it more user-friendly and configurable. But that's something uh, you'll see coming in the com coming months. Uh, so give you an example of the, the pass and partner apps. If I was a customer, I put my data in OCS, and then I can do something with it. An example of that uh, that Chris didn't get a chance to show you th this morning is that we all a bit of geeks, and we all have weather station we deploy in our houses. And we thought it would be interesting to put that data within OCS. And why? Why? Because, well, instead of each of us looking at our own weather station independently, now from a single place, we can put that everybody a weather station and different things. That's kind of interesting. And the way we did it, we didn't integrate directly with the device itself, but we just connect to the platform uh, ambient weather network. So doing cloud to cloud integration, very simple Azure function, connecting to their platform, connecting to our platform, and copying the data. And it's kind of interesting. That's very easy to do. And if you look at the trend for their platform, that's fine. We have the same trend with the same data. And that's pretty cool. At least the value is that I can look at my house and, and Greg's house and Chad's house and other people's house and see what the weather, what, how much rain they get. I didn't get any since May, but I know Chris this morning in Philadelphia, I think, got a lot of it. So it's kind of interesting. Another thing that's more interesting, though, is that when I'm looking back to the data from a couple of months ago from ambient weather, they're just aggregating that data. I just have one single value per day, which is the average temperature or precipitation, and just a range min max. So you can't even tell what's happening every day. You can't even tell which day it's there. That's the temperature in my house, and that's not really good. Because we did copy the data in OCS, and we keep it every minute at the highest resolution, that's the train I get for the same data in OCS. So now you can see why you would do such a thing, and you can see how OCS delivers the same value proposition of the price system, being a system record, as Greg said uh, this morning, and keeping high-resolution data for you to do interesting things. Uh, going to the next uh, part of the scenario, uh, partner apps. So essentially the same thing, the same data could be used to be shared with a partner. Uh, we actually have a partner that do prediction weather forecast on top of that. So he's actually using the data from our weather station and, and giving us kind of a forecast, localized forecast uh, for each of our houses, which is pretty cool. And there is a lot of them, other people working on that. So the interesting thing for an industrial operation like you guys is that from a single place, you can connect to many partners and test their application in many different ways. And, and the time to value is very quick. It's usually a couple of hours or days to get your data and get the application connects and see whether they can do interesting. So uh, you can really experiment very easily with the partners quickly. On the partner side, they see this huge opportunity to having to maintain one application only into one place and reach react to a lot of customers from a single central location. So they're very excited about that. That's why they're willing to work with us and very excited about it as well. Uh, all those partners on the slide, we have more than that. They are here at the conference. They're probably at the Boots Expo, and they can show you what they've done in terms of integration with OCS, and that, that's pretty cool. Uh, for the next one, I'm going to get Liz to come back and tell you more in detail what's happening with data science enablement. Thank you. All right. Uh, so as Laurent mentioned earlier, the second use case that we've been targeting for OSI Soft Cloud Services is data science enablement. 
Um, so what our goal here is, um, and it was kind of alluded to earlier in the keynote, is that we're not looking to do the, the analytics, but we are looking to uh, prepare the data and have it available for the analytics that you want to do. Um, so you might have any number of uh, vendor software and other applications and programs that you want to integrate your data with, um, and, and we want to support that regardless. So we want to be the data infrastructure that allows you to do uh, whatever data science, machine learning, business intelligence use cases that you have. Uh, the uh, these are just uh, some of the use cases that customers bring to me all the time for why they might want to do some of these advanced analytics. Um, but there's really a lot, of, a lot of different things that you could be doing. And many, every process really, whether it's new or whether it's been running for, for years, whether you think it's optimized already, there's always some improvement that you can be looking to get out of. Maybe it's running with fewer resources, maybe it's safety. Um, there's a lot of things you could be looking at to improve and bring more business value to your company. So there's also five keys that we've been using to develop our new capabilities in OCS. Uh, these are keys for you to actually make yourself successful when doing data science, and they're what we've been using to make sure that we're building the right products for you. So this first key here is really the most important, um, especially for advanced analytics, but probably for any application of your data. And it's all about having trustworthy data. Your users are really great um, at getting insights and creating value from the data that they're looking at. However, it doesn't mean a whole lot if the data they're looking at is bad or if they don't have trust in it. They can't have trust in the results. Um, having that trust in what you're looking at and knowing that it's one record, one system of truth, um, and it's the same across whether you're accessing it from the edge, on-prem, or the cloud is extremely important, and that's what our infrastructure allows you to do. So the second key is giving you the ability to have integration with any of the products that I mentioned that you might want to uh, support. Um, there's a whole host of platforms and applications out there that you might want to integrate your data with. Uh, you might just be looking to access data programmatically with languages like Python and R. You might be doing business intelligence and visual analytics. You might be doing machine learning. So we don't want to dictate what you have at your disposal to use, what the tools are that you can use. We want to give you the freedom and flexibility to choose what's right for you and your company and give you an ability to experiment with those as well. A uh, third key is having um, really the importance of being able to combine your people, your process, and your technology. Uh, there are also a couple keynotes that mentioned areas around this today. People are really important, and it's not just the data scientists, and it's not just the engineers. It's both of them working together. The domain expertise as well as the um, the data science expertise and really the analysis expertise, both of those coming together is what's going to make you successful. And having a variety of tools at your disposal to do that and then enabling the iterative workflows back and forth so that you can keep things running um, in order to do your analyses. So fourth, we actually start talking about the data. Um, and it's really important for it to be shaped, aligned, and ready to be ingested for whatever analytic that you're trying to do. Uh, a lot of times there's an expected shape or format. Um, you might have um, any different formats that the application that you're looking for or the application you're using is looking for your data to be in. And part of our role is to help you create that um, within OCS itself. And then when you query the data, it's ready to go in the way that you need it. And then finally, the fifth key is having enterprise support and the scale and resiliency of the cloud. With OSI Soft Cloud Services, you get that. Um, a lot of the technologies that you might be learning or using today with the Pi system, we're really trying to enable that on a much larger scale with OCS. And another great benefit of using OCS to do that is that you can join Pi data from multiple Pi systems as well as data coming from other edge or cloud sources together. So you can have a single point of aggregation and not have to do that in an external system. So just to summarize, we've got the, the five key things. Again, these are really key aspects for you to be successful, and they're what we've been using um, to make sure that we can help you be successful with those advanced analytics. 
All right, so how are we doing that? There's really two main capabilities that we've been working on in OCS uh, that were not part of the general release last June. Um, both of these we're targeting for release later this year. And they're called data views and metadata rules. So first I wanna talk about metadata. Um, for those of you that aren't super familiar with OCS yet, data is stored in units called streams. These streams can have multiple properties and you can also asso associate metada metadata with them. So metadata is just um, extra information that kind of gives you more insight into what the stream actually is. Um, so for a, a couple examples here, you might use metadata to tell the type of equipment that this stream is coming from. So for example, if you have a stream that's storing data, like a temperature measurement, um, you might have metadata that says equipment and then turbine, or you might go uh, even a level below that, which is the type of equipment and then the type of sub-equipment. Um, so you can add a lot of different metadata, and this gives you a way to provide better organization to your data. It's really useful when you're searching and querying and trying to find what you're actually interested in the system, uh, and also makes it more valuable and comprehensible for your users and applications. So for another example, you might do it, use metadata for asset identification. Um, if anyone's familiar with AF, this isn't like a, a complete asset representation in OCS. Um, we do have plans to kind of continue building upon that contextual layer in OCS, but this is a really um, kind of good way to start building that up for you by getting this information into your streams. And then as a, a final kind of example, we have uh, location. You might add <laughs> metadata to your streams to count, uh, to clarify the location where it's coming from. So it might be plant-based, might be zip codes, might be buildings, regions, areas. You get the picture. So in order to help users jumpstart and kind of get um, kind of get more um, more metadata in their system quicker, we've developed something called metadata rules. These allow users to define patterns in their stream names to quickly extract valuable information out of them and maintain that as more streams are added to the system. Uh, so to help you kind of understand what I mean by parsing the uh, stream name to get valuable information, I, I'm gonna walk you through an example here. So I've got four streams. Um, these are all coming from our OSIsoft account in OCS. Um, just looking at them really quickly, you can see there's a couple similarities. Um, you don't have to dive too far in them, but I'm pretty familiar with them as the subject matter expert. Um, so I know that the six digits in the middle are really important. Um, the 101, 201 actually represents the unit ID where the stream is coming from. So that's something that I definitely want to capture and add as metadata. So I'm going to start building a pattern for, this, um, for these stream names. Okay, so now we've got a wild card in the middle, wild card at the end, and unit ID in the middle. The next part that's really interesting to me is what comes after that. We've got analog value zero, analog value 100. Both of these actually represent measurements, what's actually stored in the stream. So uh, I think analog value zero is percent cooling. And I think analog value 100 is room temperature. So these are other things that I want to capture. So I'm going to make that into another metadata. And we'll call that measurement. Then we have the part at the end. Uh, we've got pres present value and status flags. To be honest, I don't really care about these. So we're just going to treat them as a wild card. So anything at the end will get matched. I still want the same metadata created for those streams. Then at the beginning, we've got the um, BACnet connector dot building. Uh, so these streams actually were originally created by the BACnet interface. They went into our Pi system, and then we used Pi to OCS to transfer them to OCS. So we retained that stream name information all the way from Pi to OCS. And this part is really just informational, but I want to keep it as part of the prefix to the pattern. So now we've got an entire pattern here, the BACnet connector dot building. We've got two sets of metadata that we're interested in parsing from these names, and then we don't care what comes at the end. So now I want to show you what this actually looks like in the OCS portal, trying to um, actually define one of these rules. 
So the first thing we're going to do is search for a stream. And this is just to find a stream to use as, as an example when we start building out our pattern. So I'm just going to pick one of these that I'm familiar with, go to the next page. And again, we're going to start with those six digits in the middle. I know that those are really important. So I'm going to go ahead and select the delimiters around them to tell you that that's a section that I'm interested in capturing. So I'm going to go ahead and give it the metadata key value key that I want it to be called. And then again with the analog value, I'm going to call that measurement. We'll make the end the wild card, like we just did on the slide before. And then we'll capture the beginning prefix uh, as a string literal, just as it's written from the streams. All right, so now we've got the complete pattern definition up here at the top. Looks just like it did on the slide before. And then we're going to go to the next page and actually define what metadata values should be captured for the two metadata keys that we described before. Um, so the first one was the unit ID. So I'm just copying those values directly out of the names. And then the second one for the measurement, I want to map those to something that I actually understand. Uh, just like I said, I wasn't sure if analog value zero was percent cooling or not. Um, I actually want to map this into something that my users can utilize uh, without having to come ask me what they are again. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, I'm doing this for several different streams that I already know follow this pattern. And then once I'm done with that, we'll have the chance to preview uh, what this rule would create. Uh, so now we have a list of streams, and then the third and fourth columns show you the metadata that executing this rule would then create. So we've got the unit ID, 101, 201, and most of those. Then at the bottom, we have 101, 203. And then we've got the different measurements in the fourth column. Uh, something that's really interesting about the rules that we're building is that they'll actually run in the background. So if you create a new stream that follows the same pattern, we'll pick that up automatically and create the same metadata or the, the metadata that would be associated with that stream. So that makes it a lot easier to kind of maintain and move forward as you start adding more streams. And then once you have a really large system, you don't have to go through. And you can modify in bulk if you modify the rules. So that's it for metadata rules. Uh, the second capability that I want to talk to you about, you've already kind of seen some in the keynotes, and that's data views. So like I said earlier, data views are prepared data sets read, ready for analytics consumption. Uh, there's a lot of organization and structure that goes into preparing data, aligning it, joining everything you're interested in. So this is what this is all about. Um, so data views themselves are resources in OSI Soft Cloud Services. Uh, you, the, the definition itself is a JSON structure. And then when you query the data, um, you actually can get that back just in JSON as a CSV uh, or as a table with headers as well, which makes it really powerful and ready to use uh, tables of information like you saw just going straight into the Azure machine learning earlier. Uh, the data is accessible via the REST API, uh, the, the OCS REST API. Uh, so we're really targeting for a for our first release, the developer data scientist, someone that's comfortable accessing things using a REST API. We also have a Python client in OSIsoft's GitHub, uh, which is what I was using in the Jupyter Notebook earlier to um, access the data there. Um, and you can create also your data views through the UI or programmatically. So if you have a, a shape or a format that might be changing, or if you want to change the uh, streams that are going into that data view on the fly, you can do that programmatically as well. And then when you query data, um, it's, a, it's a pull architecture. It's not a push architecture. Um, so we're surfacing it through the API. When you're ready for data, it's on demand. You query, you get back the interpolated table of results that you've seen. And then it's ready to go in a number of applications here. All right, so let's show you this in OCS. Um, portal as well. So the first step for the data views is selecting your streams. Um, so here I'm just generating a query that we'll use to actually formulate what streams go into the data view. So instead of just picking a single stream before, I'm really trying to capture all of the ones that I want to be included. So once I've got that result set ready to go, I go to the next page. And this is about mapping those result, the, the streams there into the table, what I actually want to be able um, to query for when I ask for the data. 
Uh, so we've got a really wide table right now. Every property got mapped into its own column by default. So in order to make this a little bit more usable, I'm going to group things and align them using some of the metadata that we created with the rules. Uh, so we're going to do the side of the building, the floor of the building, um, and the different units. And once we apply that, you'll see we get a couple. We still have the, the time alignment on the left-hand side, but the next couple of columns are the, the metadata values. Um, so we have a couple units that aren't on the side of the building. That's actually floor one, uh, so which doesn't have a side. It spans the whole thing. Uh, and then we have the floor and the unit, and then we have the sequential data on the right-hand side. And now I'm actually just going to remove a couple columns that aren't interesting to me for this particular analysis. And now we have something that I'm actually going to be able to use. And that's it. And now I'm going to call up Janelle to talk about data ingress. Thanks, Liz. Um, as Liz said, my name is Janelle, I'm Janelle Minnick. I'm also a product manager here at OSI Soft, and I have been working of late on some of the underlying components of Pi, uh, excuse me, of OCS. So we're going to talk about how you might get your data into OCS. So you've heard in our great keynotes this morning about all the great things you can do. Liz just finished talking about some of the advanced <laughs> analytics that you're going to be able to do. So you may be wondering, how do I get my data up there so that I can do that? There are two main ways right now that you can do that. We're going to talk about OMF, and we're going to talk about Pi to OCS. So. OMF is our own messaging format, something that we defined. It's called OSI Soft Message Format. And what this does is it lets um, other applications send data in a standard way up to OCS. So if you're uh, wanting to write something custom, if you're working with one of our partners, you're using data stored from the edge, things of that nature, um, those things that talk OMF already will send that data up to OCS. Or if you don't have something that already talks OMF, you can certainly write something or hire someone to write something uh, OMF compliant. Um, so that's good news. We have lots of different things we can pull OMF data into, or excuse me, from. Uh, the other thing about this slide is that, uh, and you've heard this mentioned a couple of times today already, but we are going to be supporting later this year the European Data Center. So for those of you who have uh, uh, data here in Europe, you'll be able to keep that data in country whether it's OMF or the next connection technology I'm going to talk about in a minute. Okay. So the other way that you can pull data in to OCS is through something we call Pi to OCS. It was a very creative name. It means that you take your data from Pi and put it in OCS. So first of all, um, who here has a Pi system? Anybody? I hope. Oh, good. You're in the right room. Anybody here use Pi to Pi? Oh, okay, good. Or connectors, have you used connectors before? All oh, right, awesome. Okay, so Pi to OCS is kind of like the next generation of that. Um, it's gonna let you move your data from your existing on-premise Pi system into OCS. And it's, um, I'm gonna go through all these points, but it's really easy to use. You'll see that uh, here a little bit. Um, so we like to position it as central, simple, and secure. And what I mean by that is, you're gonna manage this centrally from a single portal um, it's simple, it's easy to use, it's very click, 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 add a couple of pieces of information like where you want the data to go to and where you want it to come from, and um, it's secure. We use claims technology and identity servers and identity providers to um, make sure that your data is secure. So, and the best of breed, uh, so the point I want to make there is that if you've used Pi to Pi or connectors or some of those types of technologies, you're used to setting those things up rather manually. Pi to OCS is going to build all you need automatically for you. It's going to build your streams in OCS for you once you've defined what it is you want to bring over. It's going to set up the security for you, uh, with the, something that's akin to a trust. Um, and then, again, you can just manage it all centrally there in the portal. So much like OMF, we will be supporting the European data uh, namespace, excuse me, uh, at the end of the year for Pi to OCS also. It's really OCS wide. So anything that writes up to OCS, you could store it in your European namespace if you wanted to by the end of the year. And I just wanted to highlight this architecture a little bit, um, just to be super clear. Uh, when you're running this on-prem, you're gonna wanna plan to run your Pi to OCS agent on a separate computer than your Pi server. 
technically it would work, but just like we would say with an interface to run it separately, um, it gives your Pi server more of its resources to do what it needs to do if it's separate. Okay, and then um, you might be wondering, well, what kind of data could I transfer from my Pi system? Does it support everything? Because there's lots of different data types, lots of different data. This is what we support today. So you can pull over your historical data. You can pull over something we call streaming data. So streaming data is not quite snapshot data. It is the most previously written value in the archive, so the newest archive value. Okay, so new updates, new, newly archived values will get sent. We support both classic and base pi point types. So your traditional classic point types, your analytic results for the base ones, for example. And you can pull that data in from many, many different data archives. Each data archive would use its own pi to OCS agent. So I'm going to give you a brief demo of what it looks like to manage these connections in the portal. Um, if you're interested in seeing what it looks like to actually do the install, I have a video demo of that at our booth. But in the interest of time, we're just going to do um, portal management right now, configuration. So I'm going to go to cloud.osisoft.com. That's how you get into our OCS. And I'm going to use my secure authentication and sign in. Now we support multiple identity providers. We support Azure Active Directory. Google and Microsoft accounts. I've given it my account name, and now I'm going to sign in with my Google, ad Google address, um, provide my information here. And because we trust Google as an identity provider, and they said, I am who I say I am, I get access to the cloud. So there I'm signed in. Now I'm going to go over to the configuration panel here and go manage my connections. So um, by default, it'll show your OCS connections first, but we're gonna, I just wanted to highlight briefly that you can also see any of the OMF connections you may have configured. I'm not going to go into great detail here. Um, they will do a great job of showing that at the uh, Edge data booth, if you haven't seen that. I'm going to look at Pi system connections, which really is the Pi to OCS connections. And I'm going to select my second connection in the list here. You can see I have more, more than one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk you through what you see over here in the details panel. So the first thing you might notice is I have a button at the top where I could actually download the install kit. So if I've never run this install kit, this is where you get it. You just download it from here once you're authenticated, run it locally where you want to run it. And when you configure it, then it'll have all this information. You can also get the user guide if you want that. Um, but you can see what you called it, what Pi server it's talking to, the version of that Pi server. Um, the version of the agent that's running, whether it's technically registered with OCS, meaning it's, it knows about it and it's able to get data. You can see the data flow, where it's coming from, where it's going to. You can also see the status of the service. So in this case, I don't know if you can see, but this status is stopped. So that's not good. We need to start that. So I'm going to click the Start button. And it's going to ask me, are you sure you want to start that? And I say, yes, I want to start that. And the status goes from stop to started right away. And um, you might start to notice that the current activity changes. So it tells me exactly what it's doing. And then it starts to tell me how many events per second of which type of data it's transferring. So right now it's looking at some historical values. Um, soon you'll see the streaming values update. One of the other things that we do here in this uh, panel is we show you the search criteria that you used when you decided what data you want to transfer from your Pi system. So we capture that. We show that to you at the top. Here we can see more information, uh, the last streaming read timestamp. This green historical transfer bar indicates how many of the archives that are online that you've already processed. We've already processed them all, but I stopped this to just show you what that looks like when it's transferring data. And then. Um, the start and end time of all my data that I've already transferred. Now, I'm looking at my other connection here, and I can see that it says update recommended. You might remember that Chris Nelson pointed that out this morning in the keynote as well. And just to show you what you'll see in the panel, if you um, have that situation, you might see an error message. We see a last communication error message up there, but we also see another big orange message telling us it's time to update the agent. So what I would do is I would go to the computer where that agent is running and just re-download the install kit and execute it, and then you're good to go. So that's just a really brief highlight of uh, central management of your connections and starting and stopping that data transfer. With Pi to OCS, as you can see, it's, it's fairly straightforward and it's very simple. I didn't have to build a single stream or tag or anything. It just did it all 
um, when I installed that kit. So um, if you have questions about Pi to OCS or how you want to get your data into OCS, please come see us at the booth. We'll be there all week. But with that, I'm going to hand it back to Laurent. He's going to share with you more about how we're going to go to market. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Lise. So I have a 14 seconds to conclude. I'm be, I'll be super fast. Uh, go to market. So we've been released since a couple of months now. Uh, a lot have happened since we released. I mean, we didn't have data views. We didn't have a lot of trending. The whole stuff, the, the cadence for developing and, and releasing on OCS is pretty fast, uh, much, faster, much faster than the Pi server. Uh, it's going to be licensed and priced on subscription. Uh, we extended our promotional offer. We started in June until the end of the year. So the, this offer is a six months commitment to using OCS. And, and part of that is the three months just to evaluate OCS and also to gauge how much usage you have on OCS. And usage is based on the data stream access per month. And I know that's something very new, different than the Pi server. And let me explain what it looks like. Essentially, if you look at the usage over a couple of months and the list of stream on, 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 on the left-hand side, essentially all the green dots is when you access one stream one time during a period of a day, okay? So every day we're just looking at all the thing and it's kind of a zoom up of those number here, that's total stream access per day. And what we do, we give you like a live, live report or weekly report of that usage so you know where you stand. And every day over a period of a month, we just average that. And then you can consume more or less every month or every day. And depending on your commit, we'll tell you where you fit into, into that. So the, the beauty about that is that you just pay for what you use and what you're looking at. And we allow you to store 10 times more than actually what you're looking at. So if you commit for 1,000 stream access per month, then you can store 10,000 stream in data archive in OCS. And you can look at the thing 1,000 a day, the next 1,000 the other day, all of them at one a month, none for the other month. So you can average and make your consumption more flexible than we, we have with the, the Pi server. Uh, in terms of the roadmap, of course, OCS doesn't have the maturity of the Pi server and the richness, so we have a lot of stuff we want to do because we can try and bring the same, uh, uh, same capabilities. Uh, but we already have the same flexibility, access, resiliency, and availability we have the Pi system. So uh, what's available today is really the disintegration with the partner apps, uh, getting data from OMF and, and Pi to OCS, and the full access to all the APIs for the different services we just talked about. Uh, what we're working on, f finalizing the data view for data science, uh, those metadata rules um, Liz talked about. Uh, as soon as EDS is going to be released, we'll have native connection to that through OMF. Uh, finishing the uh, European deployment, so that's already in place. There is a couple of APIs we need to tweak to make sure everything is working fine, but that should take only a couple of weeks. Uh, releasing the training experience and augmenting that to have uh, more more symbols and maybe saving displays or workspace so you can actually save the work you've done in visualizing the data and then more stuff. So um, enhancing the way we share data with our partners, uh, building up more context, not just as a stream level, but maybe at an equipment level and asset level. And then more stuff in terms of visualization, a community, uh, having an OCS to Pi uh, way for sending data from analytics down to OCS and down to an existing on-prem system. So you can actually uh, use the data science results for operational purposes and, and other things. So the list is long, uh, we're going fast, uh, but the be ready to see a lot of change in the coming months and years uh, on, on OCS. With that, uh, use the feedback at osisoft.com. Those links are already included in OCS. And, um, and uh, there is a couple of things that are at the booth. Uh, our booth, two for OCS, DSC and OCS, another one at the edge of the store wheel in the same corner, so that's easy. Uh, we, you missed the, the, the talk on, on security, but the recording should be avail available tomorrow. There is another talk, a uh, deep dive into the, the APIs and the for developers on, on, on Thursday. And we have two uh, partner talks uh, um, talking about OCS, one from Maya HTT and another one from, from Trainminer. Uh, they, they presented as well. Um, and that's us, the three of us, and Todd as well. I forgot you on the pictures, but he's one of the, the, the product managers working on OCS. So thank you for coming. Uh, there is a lot of stuff we didn't talk about, so please stop by and, and we'll get more detail and, and get you excited about that. Thank you very much.